Thank you very much, Mike. I'm about to embark on something very dangerous. Usually when I address a deep topic of this sort, uh, I have a manuscript or at least a PowerPoint uh, to sort of keep me in line uh, and to try to talk about essentially two separate papers in a finite amount of time uh, and do it ad lib is going to be uh, something of a challenge to me and perhaps a challenge to your patience. Uh, so I've been asked to talk about uh, some lessons for the church from the Galileo affair. So to speak about the Galileo affair, I'm going to have to begin with a certain amount of history of astronomy. Last night we all sang together uh, for the beauty of the earth, for the glory of the skies. Uh, and the idea of beauty in the universe is a very compelling thing. Cosmos is the same word, uh, same root as cosmetic. It means something beautiful. Uh, and uh, I was uh, struck by one of the quotations that Mike Peterson used this afternoon from C.S. Lewis. They are a great fountain of energy and beauty spurting up from the very center of reality. So looking at the heavens inspired even ancient peoples by the beauty of the cosmos. And there's a wonderful quotation from Ptolemy. When I can trace at my will the motions to and fro of the planets, I no longer touch earth with my feet, but I take my fill of ambrosia, the food of the gods. So you may have heard things about the Ptolemaic system, and you think it turned out to be very clumsy, filled with way too many circles, and finally collapsed under its own weight. But in reality, Ptolemy's Almagest uh, was a very important work in the history of science because it showed for the first time that the apparently complex motion of the heavens uh, could in fact be explained by mathematical principles that were relatively simple. It is against this background that Copernicus appears on the scene at the beginning of the 16th century. There's a lot of mythology about what it was that Copernicus did. That somehow the Ptolemaic system had become so complicated and overburdened with circles that it was about ready to collapse under its own weight. Or that new observations had shown that it was so creaky it wasn't giving good results anymore. None of that is true. What Copernicus saw was yet another step in this cosmic vision of beauty. In working with the circles and the angles of the Ptolemaic system, he saw that there was something unusual that seemed to happen without explanation. The planets, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, in their rounds normally move eastward in the sky, but occasionally they will come to a stop and go the other direction instead. Uh, once a year, approximately, for Jupiter and Saturn, once every two years for Mars. And this always happens when the planet is opposite the sun in the sky, as if there's some connection with the sun. But it wasn't explained. It was just one of those facts in itself. And Copernicus saw that if you did some rearranging of the circles and put them going around the sun instead of going around the earth, something wonderful happened that automatically the circle for Mercury was closest to the sun. It was the fastest planet that went around in about three months. And Saturn, the most lethargic planet going around in nearly 30 years was at the farthest outer edge and the rest of the planets fell neatly in between 
And not only that, it then became completely obvious why the planets had to go retrograde when they were opposite the sun. It was because in their closest approach, the Earth, going faster than Mars or the others, automatically bypassed them. As you're in the fastest car lane going down the superhighway, as you pass the slower car against the distant scenery, for a moment or so, that car will appear to swing backwards with respect to the farthest fields and so on. Once Copernicus got to that point, there was no turning back. This was an aesthetic view. It was something that was unifying the solar system and making it appear beautiful. And it was totally ridiculous. I mean, if the Earth is spinning around every 24 hours, why don't people fly off into space? And how could the Earth be going around the sun every year and keep the moon in tow? So when the book came out, it was seen as the up-to-date up way to compute the position of a planet. But as far as physical reality is concerned, everybody knew it was complete nonsense. There wasn't any physics to go with this. Okay, that's the background that we need for looking at the Galileo affair. It was Johannes Kepler working north of the Alps. He was a Lutheran. He went to the University of Tübingen. He got acquainted with Michael Mestlin, who was a rather conservative Copernican, at least he taught Kepler about it, and Kepler became a very enthusiastic Copernican. Not because there was any actual proof for it, but because it represented to Kepler the Holy Trinity. God the Father, represented by the Son at the middle, Jesus Christ by the far ring of stars, the shell of stars, and the Holy Spirit, the space in between. Now you may say, wow, that's sure a nutty idea. But it captured Kepler, and Kepler wrote the first enthusiastic treatise after Copernicus's own book, The De Revolutionibus, which was published in 1543. Kepler's published in 1596. Kepler was very pleased with his little book, uh, and a friend was going down to Italy, so he sent a couple of copies with him saying, give these to anybody who seems really interested. His friend was already coming back from Italy, and he realized he still had these two books in his luggage. And he asked around who would be interested, and he was told that this professor at Padua was kind of interested in things like that. So he gave both copies to this man, and who dashed off a letter to Kepler, uh, thanking him and saying he was privately a Copernican. Kepler scratched his head and wrote a letter to his teacher, Michael Mestlin. He said, I've just got this reply from this man who has the same last name as first name, Galileo Galilei. Uh, so he obviously hadn't heard about Galileo before. Galileo promised to send one copy down to Rome, and he kept the other himself. Kepler wrote back to him and saying, if you're a Copernican, stand forth publicly with your view. But Galileo didn't answer. Time marches on, and uh, Galileo gets increasingly restless teaching geocentric astronomy to the students at, in Padua, having to board students to make ends meet, and being very jealous of the professor of medicine, his old friend, who had twice the salary he did. And I always say, well, what's new? Uh, <laughs> but uh, then, then something very remarkable happened, and that is that Galileo got the word about a new kind of spyglass which was being peddled around Europe. He either had a chance to see one or perhaps just got the description that it was a tube with two lenses in it. 
It didn't take him very long to figure out how to do it and to get busy grinding lenses and to make his own device, uh, which he called in Italian an occhioli or in Latin a perspiculum. Uh, the word telescope wasn't invented for a, uh, a year or two, but I'll call it that. Uh, Kepler uh, quickly discovered some key thing, not Kepler, Galileo, some key things about uh, putting the lenses in, uh, namely that lenses were uh, pretty awful in their optical qualities and you got a lot better images if you put a diaphragm at the end and really stopped it down because the things he was going to look at as, a, as it turned out, did not need that much light gathering power. By August of 1609, he was able to show an eight power telescope to the senators in nearby Venice. And by uh, later that fall, he had got up to a 20 power telescope, which he then turned to the moon. And he was astonished by what he saw. The line between the light and the dark part of a crescent moon we call the terminator. And what he discovered was that alongside the terminator, in the dark part of the moon, there were these little points of light along the terminator. And he knew enough about light and shadows to realize very quickly that those must be the peaks of mountains which were just beginning to get the sunlight as the sun was moving across the surface of the moon. And that was a very interesting discovery. It must have excited him a great deal because he realized that if the moon had mountains on it, the moon was Earth-like. It was not the pure sphere that he had expected it to be or that everybody seemed to have expected it to be. So, he began making some watercolor sketches of the moon uh, starting in the end of November and through December of 1609. And then in January, the moon was very, very close, just about three degrees away from Jupiter. And so it was easy for him to switch his telescope from the moon to Jupiter, and he was rather surprised. There were three little stars beside Jupiter, which wouldn't be really worth remarking about, excepting they were in a perfectly straight line. So he said, guided by what fates he knew not, he took a look again the next night. And there they were, but not where he expected them. He thought he knew which way Jupiter was moving, and it didn't seem quite right. So he decided to check up again the next night, but it was cloudy. So uh, he then, he then started in, and I've looked very, very carefully at his, at his notes on this, and I think he didn't really keep good notes for those first two nights. Uh, he, he realized by the third night that he'd better write this up. And you can see that the ink is all the same. And then after that, for each day, there's just a little bit of variation from the pen nib and so on. It's a wonderful sheet this sheet of Galileo's first week of, of observations of Jupiter. Because I think it's one of the most exciting pages, manuscript pages in the history of astronomy. Because you can see as he's going down day after day, all of a sudden there are four of them instead of just three. And when he gets to the bottom of the page and turns the page over, something dramatic happens. The first side is all in Italian. When you turn it over, it continues in Latin. Why? Because Latin was the international language of science and of scholarly communication. And it was plain that he had some news to tell the world. And I think that someplace along there in that page was Galileo's conversion from being a timid Copernican to being an enthusiastic Copernican. There was so much new that his telescope was finding that somehow the old way of doing things needed to be rethought. 
and something uh, placed in a new way. But having those four moons of uh, Jupiter, realizing that they were going around the planet, gave him an idea. He had a naming opportunity. And he was so keen to get a government job down in Florence at the court of Cosimo de' Medici. And so he would name them after uh, Cosimo. He thought he would call them the Cosmian stars. By and by the letter came back from the Grand Duke's private secretary who said, people won't get it. They'll just think they're the cosmic stars. You'd better call them the Medicean stars. Well, Galileo had already rushed the starting pages of his book to the press. And so they had to paste little slips of paper over where it said Cosmian stars to change it to the Medicean stars. Well, it worked. He got the job uh, and was able to move down to Florence. He allowed himself just one Copernican comment in this, uh, in his Sidereus Nuncius, the starry messenger. Uh, he said, this should give some pause to those who are reluctant to believe the Copernican system because they can't understand how the earth could keep the moon in tow. But everybody agrees that Jupiter is moving and it keeps its four moons in tow as it goes around the sun. So it wasn't a proof of the Copernican system, but it was a step in making it slightly more uh, logical and acceptable. Uh, it is, as, as you know, uh, uh, Richard Dawkins says that uh, somehow uh, evolution makes uh, uh, atheism uh, more intellectually fulfilling. Well, anyway, Galileo's books and his statements made uh, Copernican, the Copernican system, more intellectually fulfilling. Uh, but it was, a, it was a long kind of process because Galileo would, at that point, have loved to find some proof for the motion of the Earth. Well, I think Galileo really liked his sleep. Uh, the record books show that he essentially never got up before dawn to make an observation. Sometimes he would stay up a little bit after midnight, but not too much after. And you see, there in Padua at that time, the planet Venus was in the morning sky, so he didn't observe it. But by the time he got up to Florence, Venus was moving into the evening sky. Now, in the Ptolemaic system, Venus went around in an epicycle, in a big circle, always between uh, the Sun and the Earth, which means that it could never reflect a full face, because for that it would have to be on the far side of the Sun. On the other hand, in the Copernican system, Venus would go around the sun and would show the entire set of phases. So he started observing Venus, and it was just a little kind of a dot. It didn't look like it had much of a phase at all. By, by the beginning of December, though, it was down looking like a half moon. And now the question was, which way is it going to go? Is it going to go back to the full phase? In other words, is it on an epicycle that's always on the far side of the sun? Or is it going to go all the way around the sun? Is it going to go into a crescent phase? Now, Galileo wanted to make all of the discoveries. But on the other hand, he knew it would be disastrous if he announced the discovery and Venus didn't go into a crescent phase what to do, because he was afraid he might be scooped by the Jesuits down at the Collegio Romano in Rome, who by this time had the telescope. And especially when his young protege, uh, Benedetto Castelli, wrote him a letter saying you should look for the phases of Venus. And if Castelli could think about it, so could Father Clavius down in Rome. Oh, this was terrible. 
Uh, he didn't want to have a disaster, you see. Uh, okay, so he coded his message in a cryptic Latin statement, scrambled all the letters, sent it on a letter that was going to Cosimo's brother up in Prague, knowing full well that he would give the letter to Kepler and that Kepler would go nuts trying to decipher it. And then a month later, it went into the crescent phase and Galileo was sure and he decoded it and Kepler published the solution. Well, uh, it looks like the Ptolemaic theory was doomed by this observation. But was the Copernican theory established? No, because in the meantime, the astronomer Tycho Brahe had proposed another, an alternative cosmology. Tycho was a great observer, spent many nights under the stars, and he probably started thinking, you know, there's got to be some reality to these circles we have for the sky. We can't uh, uh, just uh, uh, assume that this is hypotheses and so on, but clearly it's ridiculous to have the earth moving. It's totally against physics, and it's also against Holy Scripture. He always put it in that order. Because, well, let me come to that in just a moment. Uh, but the Tychonic system proposed that the earth was solidly fixed in the middle of the cosmos, but that the sun went around the earth carrying the planets around it. So that Mercury and Venus went around the sun as the sun moved around the earth. That meant that Mercury or Venus, by going around the sun, would have the whole set of phases. So Galileo had not, with this observation, managed to prove things. Anyway, uh, the power behind the throne there in Florence was Cosmo's mother, uh, the Grand Duchess Christina, who would have these sort of intellectual brunches in which she would invite in members of the clergy or professors or so on. And uh, so Castelli got invited to one of these, and Christina turns to him and says, what's this about these observations Galileo is making? Uh, are those things for real? And Castelli said, yes, of course, even the Jesuits at the Collegio Romano have confirmed them. Ah, she says, and now what's this about the Copernican system and the sun standing still? After all, uh, Joshua at the Battle of Gibeon asked God to command the sun to stand still, not the earth. Oh, said Castelli, I'm sure Galileo can explain this for you. Well, probably Galileo, who wasn't that much brushed up on church fathers and things like that, was probably thrown into some confusion by this, but he sat down and began to write out a response to Castelli. Uh, and he said that you had to be careful about how you interpreted scripture because scripture is written uh, not as a technical treatise but in the words of the common man so that it could be uh, well understood uh, by everybody and not just the uh, philosophers or the clergy and so on. Uh, in fact he quoted one of the cardinals from the uh, Vatican who said the Bible teaches how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. Uh, so this little treatise then got passed around and it fell into the hands of the uh, leading theologian in Rome, uh, Cardinal Bellarmina, who had taught astronomy at the Louvain and who felt he knew a lot about what was going on. And he wrote uh, a letter to back to Galileo, and it said, For to say that assuming the earth moves and the sun stands still saves all the appearances better than eccentrics and epicycles is to speak well. This has no danger in it and suffices for the mathematicians. 
but to affirm that the sun is really fixed in the center of the heavens and that the earth revolves around the sun is a very dangerous thing, not only irritating the theologians and philosophers, but by injuring our holy faith and making sacred scriptures false. To, determine, to demonstrate that the appearances are saved by assuming the sun is at the center and the earth is in the heavens is not the same thing as to demonstrate that in fact the sun is in the center and the earth is in the heavens. Well, clearly Bellarmina meant that just because the phases of Venus could be explained by the Copernican system did not mean that the Copernican system had been proved because of the Tychonic system. So much as Galileo would have liked to have provided a proof, uh, he was sort of stuck in that way, but he was nervous that the Catholic Church might come down on a particular cosmology, and he wanted, he hoped that the, it, this issue could be kept open because he saw that there would be a serious possibility that the Copernican system might be right. So, Galileo made a trip to Rome to speak to members of the hierarchy to persuade them to have it open. Now this was a tough sell because at this time the Counter-Reformation was going on and the Catholics were trying to maintain a uh, solidarity on their views and that meant that the whole idea of an amateur theologian like Galileo telling them how to interpret scripture was just something they could not bear. Uh, and so they had to think, you know, what are we going to do about this? And the first thing they did was to take a look at, Gal at Copernicus's book. Well, it was hard to know exactly how much realism Copernicus intended for his system. So just to make sure, Copernicus's book was put on the index of prohibited books until corrected. And the corrections didn't come around until 1620 and they were in about 10 places in the book, uh, essentially to make the book appear more hypothetical. So that instead of saying uh, on the threefold motion of the uh, earth and its explication, it was changed to read on the hypothesis of the threefold motion of the earth and its explication, and so on in this way. Galileo was also called in by Bellarmina and was given a little talking to about how it was necessary to maintain the party line against the Lutherans north of the Alps and that he had better be careful and he should not uh, teach the Copernican system nor hold that view. And Galileo essentially promised to be good and went back and did not write or speak out about cosmological things, although he got mm, into various uh, arguments and discussions on, on other astronomical affairs with some of the Jesuits. Well, uh, he bided his time and by and by in uh, 1624 a new pope came to the throne and it was a uh, fellow uh, Tuscan from, Fl from Florence uh, and somebody that Galileo knew and Galileo hastened down to Rome to consult with him about the possibility of his writing a treatise on uh, cosmology. I'm not sure exactly what it was that Pope Urban VIII expected. Perhaps a dry technical treatise filled with geometry telling the difference between the Ptolemaic, Tychonic, and Copernican system or something like that. Galileo, however, wrote a very lively book in the vernacular Italian. He wanted to call it on the flux and reflux of the sea, that is to say on the tides, because by that time Galileo thought that he had a physical proof for the motion of the earth. Namely, if the earth weren't rotating, you wouldn't have tides. Now, we know today that's a totally spurious argument, but nevertheless, Pope Urban told him 
that, you know, this is a bad idea because it will give too much focus to what you believe is a physical proof of the Copernican system. Whereas in reality, God in his infinite wisdom and power could have made the tides in many other ways, including those beyond human intellect. So Galileo, somewhat chastened, went off to write the book with a different title, The Dialogue on the Two Chief World Systems. It was a dialogue between three participants who discussed the various issues. Uh, there was Sagrido, the wise man in the middle. There was Salviati, uh, who was essentially Galileo's mouthpiece for the Copernican system. Salviati almost always agreed with his arguments. And then there was Simplicio. Uh, you chuckle. So did the Italians. Simplicio was actually a 6th century Aristotelian philosopher. But he came out at the short end of the arguments. But the really bad thing was, the really stupid thing that Galileo did, was he placed the Pope's argument in the mouth of, Gal of Simplicio. Right at the climax of the book where the, the argument from the tides is presented and Sagredo says, this is such a clever thing, I, I'm surprised nobody noticed it before. And, Simplicio has to sort of agree that it's impressive, but as the most eminent man has told him, God in his infinite wisdom and power could have made the tides many other ways. And when the book came out, the mud hit the fan, and uh, uh, Urban, who was in considerable political trouble because of the rivalry between the French and the Spanish cardinals, which were on the opposite sides, of the succession for the Holy Roman Emperor. Uh, he was walking a political tightrope and he called, demanded that Galileo come down to Rome uh, to face an inquiry. And the result of this was that uh, Galileo appeared before the Inquisition on three successive occasions, and Galileo's bravado in the first one melded away when he realized that he was not going to uh, have any serious discussion of heliocentrism, but it was going to be on the whole issue of solidarity down there, and uh, that he was essentially disobeying orders to have taught the Copernican system this way in the book. And uh, the, uh, so the whole heliocentrism was not really discussed. He was charged with a vehement suspicion of heresy. He was found guilty, but not of that, because he was allowed by the Dominicans to plead not guilty, that he hadn't believed in the Copernican system. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, he had to have been prevaricating on this. He maybe thought, you know, I really wanted to believe in it, but I never could find an absolute proof of it. Honest guys, I didn't believe in it. Well, I don't know. Uh, he was found guilty of uh, essentially disobeying orders. And he was put under house arrest for the rest of his life. The case was reopened, in a certain sense, by Pope John Paul II, uh, who uh, looked into it and said, among other things, that the irony of the case was that Galileo's uh, theological arguments were, in fact, much better than those he was contending with. And Pope John Paul uh, went on to say, that the Bible teaches how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. Uh, but we have to look back on this and say, where in the world did things go so wrong on this Galileo affair? In 1616, when Galileo had gone down to Rome, the Pope asked his consultants, 
about the status of the heliocentric system. They were not astronomers by any means. They were just ordinary clerics, members of this uh, particular committee. And they decided, not by looking at the astronomy, but by looking at Holy Scripture, where Psalm 104 says, the Lord God laid the foundations of the earth that it not be moved forever, which pretty much goes against a Copernican system. And uh, so it is, uh, they said that one of the statements uh, was formally heretical. That was about the uh, fixing the sun. And the motion of the earth was erroneous, foolish, and, uh, but uh, uh, not heretical. That was an opinion that was not publicized at all. That was a private internal document, but it played a great role in the end by the time Galileo was called down there. Uh, and I think that's, with those consultants, was where the misstep occurred. Because they were just accepting what was the common opinion. The whole ridiculousness of the earth moving. They couldn't see beyond that that there might be a serious alternative. And so they simply looked for some proof texts to back up their view. And that was, in the end, a disaster. But it wasn't that the Catholic Church was digging in its heels and trying to prevent the progress of science. They were, they were simply voting with common opinion, something that more or less everybody believed was nonsense. Kepler, up north of the Alps, uh, was uh, it faced some of these same issues. And so I would like to just show you what it was that he wrote when he was putting a little bit of a defense about the Copernican system when he wrote his great book, uh, The Astronomia Nova. This is the one in which he shows that the orbits of planets are elliptical. And so uh, he, uh, in his introduction, uh, he gave a fascinating analysis of Psalm 104, where he points out the parallels with the days of Genesis and shows how they can be considered two triplet pairs. Day one opens with light, day and night, while in par the pairing day four, God says, let there be lights in the firmament. Day two brings about the separation of land and water, while day four speaks of the watery and airy creatures. Day three has land bringing forth plants, while on day six, the land animals appear. In Psalm 104, the grass for the cattle comes before he appointed the moon for the seasons, the sun knoweth his going down, and so on. I assume that Kepler chose Psalm 104 for his homily because it contained the verse that I just cited about the foundations of the earth not being moved forever. But Kepler has chosen a more meaningful interpretation of that. And I quote, the psalmist does not wish to teach what men do not know, but to bring to mind what they are neglecting, to wit the greatness and power of God in the creation of such a large mass, so strong and stable. If an astronomer teaches that the earth is placed among the planets, it does not overthrow what the psalmist is saying here, nor does he contradict common experience. The earth, 
The work of God the architect does not collapse, as our buildings are wont to do, when wasted with age and decay. The mountains and shores stand firm, unmoved against the onslaught of waves and wind. I as well implore my reader not to forget the divine goodness conferred on mankind, which the psalmist urges him to consider. Let him extol the bounty of God in the preservation of living creatures of all kinds by the strength and stability of the earth, and let him acknowledge the wisdom of the Creator in its motion, so abstruse, so admirable. I would like to turn specifically to where are the lessons for the church today with respect to the Galileo affair. And quite plainly, it comes down to being open to a more metaphorical reading of scripture, to ask really what does it mean rather than accepting it as a scientific textbook. It's a great tapestry which we have uh, for science. Uh, it is, uh, as Einstein said, the sense experiences are the given subject matter, but the theories that shall interpret them are man-made, always hypothetical, never completely final, subject to question and doubt. So let me just mention a couple of things about this great tapestry of uh, science. There is, for example, the geological column, the stacking of the strata of rocks as they go up uh, through the ages. And uh, in this, this was beginning to be put together just about the time that Darwin was working on his book. Uh, it was during the 19th century that the geological column was basically established. You, it would be really neat if someplace all of the rocks were lined up that way, but you have erosion and decay that uh, wipes them out, climate changes and so on, so that even in the Grand Canyon where you have a mile deep of strata, you don't find a, the complete record. Putting it together is sort of like a three-dimensional crossword puzzle. But gradually it was assembled, and then in the 20th century it became possible to date these layers by using uh, radioactive isotopes. It's, it's rather difficult to date the uh, limestone strata, for example. They don't have the right kind of uh, elements in them, but typically you can find places where there are intrusions from uh, volcanic eruptions and the lava uh, it gives you the right kind of isotopes to do that and in the process you can then find out, for example, that the uh, Precambrian rocks or the borderline for the Cambrian dates at about 550 million years ago. Uh, so uh, this this is something that is really uh, quite astonishing. It gives a, a column in which the earliest rocks show the simplest forms of life and you don't get the vertebrates until you're substantially up in the column and so on. Uh, something that of course Darwin uh, had become aware of. This by the way, the geological column ha has nothing to do with evolution in terms of its interpretation. This is just scientific observations uh, carefully done and pointing to a very old age for the earth. If we turn to another aspect of uh, what modern science can do, we can look at the human genome. Uh, when I was a graduate student, and this is hmm, some decades ago, uh, <laughs> uh, it was still controversial as to how many chromosomes we had in human cells. 
And now even middle school students know that we've got 23 pairs of chromosomes. Uh, and what is kind of interesting is that the great apes and the chimpanzees have 24 chromosomes. Now, if we're somehow coming in the same sort of tree, uh, how come have we got only 23 and they have got 24? The chromosomes have, however, special coding at the end of, e of the DNA, the telomeres, marking the start and the stop of a chromosome so that when copying is done, it knows where to stop and where to start. And one of our chromosomes, lo and behold, has not only the telomeres at the two ends, but two telomeres next to each other right in the middle. And what you see is that each half of that chromosome is very much paired with the chromosomes of the chimpanzees. You would get 24, but excepting somewhere along the way, that fusion has taken place, and the evidence of it sits there uh, in the telomeres in the middle of the chromosome. It's quite interesting that when the Human Genome Project was uh, successfully uh, completed, one of the most astonishing things about it was that we had so few genes, 22,000. And uh, a, a simple nematode worm, uh, C. elegans, has 19,000. And some plants have more genes than we do. Uh, it, seems, it seems kind of odd, doesn't it, accepting that the genes make up less than 2% of our genome. And there's all the rest of that stuff in there. And you've got to believe that it's doing something. It was first called junk DNA. We now know that it can be extremely stable over millions of years, so it's obviously doing something. And the doing something is probably uh, having to do with control sequences. How are the genes expressed? In what order as bodies are being built? That's not evolution either. That is just uh, biochemistry and genetics. But it's telling us something very interesting. It's telling us how we have this great relationship of life forms, plants and animals, uh, all together. It is, uh, it's really wonderful to have found this kind of thing. But these are part of the grist for setting the foundations of an explanatory theory. The uh, evolution is a theory about how the species could form and what the relationships could be. And it is based upon uh, natural selection. We know that many, many species overproduce. Uh, some of the fish, as you know, send out just enormous numbers of eggs, but they don't uh, all come to maternity. But there is a whole slow process that the organisms that are more uh, uh, secure, uh, have, have stronger reasons for survival, will systematically survive uh, more thoroughly. It seems like a natural thing, although when Darwin uh, persuaded it, it was very foreign to the Victorian mind. It just seemed that it was wrong for nature to be overproducing this way. And it wasn't until around 1930 that natural selection was in fact uh, generally accepted by the scientific community. The second scheme is uh, common descent with modification. And the modification is, of course, uh, variation. 
in the, uh, in the chromosomes. Uh, the cells in our bodies are continually being damaged in one way or another and mutating, and it doesn't matter for the most part because we have two chromosomes, a pair of, the chromosomes are paired in our cells. So if one gets mutated, the other one can take over typically. So there is this protection built in. And unless a mutation is in a germ cell, it's not going any place. But there is enough variation that, for example, in uh, police forensics work, uh, DNA analysis is great for identification. This is a, a theory, of course, uh, and it is a wonderful explanatory theory. There's a lot of things that it can explain, and let me just give you a couple of examples. Look at your hands and your feet and the five digits on each. And if you visit a comparative zoology museum, you'll notice how the five sets of bones goes from the fins of the coelacanth right up the vertebrate tree. For proponents of intelligent design, these observations are a set of unrelated facts, facts in themselves, in the vocabulary of Aristotelian logic. But for the evolutionist, they are reasoned facts, observations with connectivity. So in the way, the pattern of five digits among the vertebrates becomes compelling evidence for the idea of evolution, which turns these facts in themselves into reasoned facts. And there's another category of observations where evolution offers persuasive explanations. The observations of imperfect design. Darwin gathered a number of examples, not all correct, but nevertheless, he had enough cases to make the point. And my favorite example is the red-footed booby on Genovesa Island in the Galapagos. In my book, God's Universe, which many of you have got copies of now, I described these as web-footed ducks that nest in trees and was promptly informed that boobies aren't ducks. But never mind. It's just as ridiculous having web-footed boobies trying to hang on in trees. This unusual adaptation, however, arose because the blue-footed boobies and the magnificent frigates had already taken over the ground-based ecological niches, and that's where it had to go. Now, a moment ago, I alluded in passing to intelligent design, a scheme that's controversially now advocated in some quarters as an alternative to evolution, to the extent that it should be taught as a viable option in biology classrooms. To me, this is a serious category error. And let me try to make that clear by considering a simple question posed by Sir John Polkinghorne. Why is the water in the tea kettle boiling? Well, we can answer. The water is boiling because the heat from the fire raises the temperature of the water until the molecules move faster and faster so that some escape from the surface and become a gas. But we can also answer that the water in the tea kettle is boiling because we want some tea. Well, the first answer illustrates what Aristotle called an efficient cause, an explanation of how the phenomenon takes place, while the uh, second answer, because we want some tea, is a final cause, the reason why the phenomenon takes place. One aspect of the scientific revolution of the 17th century was that it turned away from final causes so central in the Aristotelian worldview and concentrated on efficient causes, on the how of the phenomena. To me, belief in a final cause, a Creator God gives a coherent understanding of why the universe seems so congenially designed for the existence of intelligent, self-reflective life. Somehow, in the words of Freeman Dyson, this is a universe that knew we were coming. That's because only small changes in numerous physical constants would render the universe uninhabitable. 
I don't claim this as a proof for the evidence of a creator, only that to me the universe makes more sense with this understanding. But on the other hand, as a scientist, I'm interested in well, as well, in the why of the universe. I want to, uh, I'm sorry, I'm interested in the how as well as the why of the universe. I want a coherent picture of how Homo sapiens came to be. How come our DNA is so wondrously related to all forms of life? How the atoms emerged? And this understanding of how the universe works, the efficient causes, comes from the great tapestry of science which includes the theory of biological evolution. The weft of this tapestry are the observations of nature, while the warp is the framework of theoretical constructions that holds the explanations together. Well, why is there so much resistance to uh, this? I've tried to indicate some of the strands that uh, work independently of evolutionary theory. Yet I can understand how these topics might feel threatening to someone who reads Genesis 1 as verbatim history. But I think that evolution is a scary topic even for persons who take a more metaphorical view of early parts of Genesis. And why is that the case? I have been, uh, where are the tension points between religious belief and the idea of evolution? I've been putting this question to theologians and ethicists without getting a very clear answer, but I suspect it has a great deal to do with the place of humankind in the animal kingdom. We're intimately related to the animal kingdom as our shared DNA makes so richly obvious. And this sticking point goes back to the very earliest days, immediately after the publication of On the Origin of Species. The story of the famous Huxley-Wilberforce debate at the British Association for Advancement of Science meeting at Oxford in 1860 addresses this tension in a largely mythological way. Soapy Sam Wilberforce, Bishop of Oxford, went on at great length condemning Darwin's treatise, making a lame joke as to whether Huxley had an ape ancestor on his grandmother's or on his grandfather's side of the family. God has delivered him into my hands, the pugnacious Thomas Huxley, the Richard Dawkins of his day, uh, reportedly whispered and then loudly announced that he would rather be descended from an ape than from a man of means and influence who used his faculties to introduce ridicule into a grave scientific discussion. At which point Lady Brewster fainted dead away. The event did not electrify the audience, it seems. The initial reports reaching Darwin did not mention it, and we only know of this episode from a letter Huxley wrote to Darwin some days after the meeting. So it was not a big deal, but nevertheless it spotlights a crucial point. Are we simply a glorious accident, the result of random mutations? If that is the bottom line of evolution, that we are curiously intelligent beasts in a purposeless universe, little more than apes in our family tree, then there are strong religious grounds for resisting evolution. That we are little more than apes can well be a philosophical viewpoint, and it is the chosen viewpoint of some practitioners, but it is not intrinsic in evolution. So, I am on record as being psychologically incapable of believing in a purposeless universe. So I ask the question, what does it mean to be human? And I look to the most important verse of Genesis 1. God created man in his own image, male and female created he them. In other words, there is within each of us a divine spark, a touch of the infinite, conscience, and self-consciousness. And these are truly human attributes, and we may well inquire when in our long evolutionary history they arrived. And that, I suppose, is one of those tension points. The question of how does the soul relate to 
our understanding of being human. And, but it seems to me that with, well, let me just go to that story of Adam and Eve and the tree of good and evil. And surely this is a powerful metaphor about the origin of conscience and becoming human. With the God-given attribute of conscience, the understanding of right and wrong, comes responsibility, decision-making, and the ability to make wrong choices. So for me, the story of Adam and Eve and the fall is the story of becoming human. It's not important to me whether Adam and Eve were a historical couple. What is important is to see the Bible taking as its starting point the emergence of our humanness, the origin of humanity. And if we keep this as a central issue in understanding why we are special in the cosmos, then I think we should have no trouble in accepting evolution as a major explanatory scheme in comprehending the natural world. I've gone miserably over time. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you.